The next item of business is debate on motion 12344 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on a fairer Scotland for disabled people tackling the employment gap. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Jamie Hepburn to speak to and move the motion uh, around 13 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, President Officer, and uh, let me move uh, the motion uh, in my name. Uh, President Officer, on the 30th of April, this Government held our Congress on Disability, Employment in the Workplace at the Marriott Hotel uh, in Glasgow. It, it was a great day. It was attended by over 150 people with employers from the, the private, public and third sectors, as well as disabled people, representative bodies and service providers. All of the attendees were there because they are passionate about doing more to help disabled people across Scotland fulfil their potential in the labour market, a passion shared by the Scottish Government. I was privileged to be in attendance to take part in the, the day's proceedings, a chance to recognise the efforts being made, but to understand the nature of the challenges faced by disabled people seeking to get into the labour market. Those challenges are, are laid bare by the reality before us. The figures out today show that the, the gap between the employment rate for disabled and non-disabled people stands at 35.8%. President Officer, that figure is an improvement on the 2016 figure of 37.4% cited in my motion. But make no mistake, that figure is unacceptable. It represents nothing less than a social and economic injustice, an injustice we must tackle. Of course. Jamie Balfour. Uh, uh, I'm grateful to the, uh, the Minister. Why do you think the number has got worse in the last 10 years? So 10 years ago, the number was better than it is today. Is there something going on with society, or do you think there's other reasons why the figures are getting worse? Although, except it was better than two years ago, historically it is getting worse. I apologise, Mr Balfour. Jeremy Balfour. Jamie Hepburn. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I think there will be a, a multitude of reasons. I suppose the, the point where, uh, that uh, Mr Balfour has hit on, he's talked about 10 years ago, uh, and of course, 10 years ago, we hit that uh, significant economic downturn that we've come through and that we see the figures uh, are still uh, uh, far too uh, wide and are only uh, beginning to improve, albeit marginally, uh, in uh, the last uh, year or so. So there'll be a multitude of reasons. Uh, of course, that's uh, our responsibility now to to truly understand them. Uh, a lot of that will be uh, attitudinal, a lot of it will be uh, institutional, uh, and that's, those are the, the uh, issues that we must tackle to, to uh, overcome uh, the uh, disability employment gap. And we have, uh, of course, as a government presiding officer, set our target of reducing the disability employment gap by more uh, than half. At the Congress uh, that I referred to earlier, the First Minister made a number of key announcements. The, the launch of a consultation on public sector disability employment targets, funding of up to £1 million to support businesses to recruit and retain disabled people. And that later this year, we'll publish a cross-government disability employment plan, which will set out how we'll go about increasing disability employment rates. The Congress wasn't the start of this journey. When we published a Fairer Scotland for Disabled People in December 2016, as well as setting out the ambition to more than half the disability employment gap, we set out a range of commitments to support disabled people in the labour market. These commitments are underway. The implementation of Fair Start Scotland, a devolved employment service that started last month, is aimed at helping large numbers of disabled people into employment. In the media campaign we ran last summer, directed at small and medium-sized businesses, aimed to raise awareness with groups we know we need to reach to make a difference. And some, such as the internship programmes underway, are aimed at changing the culture of those organisations who are participating as well as developing the employability skills of those involved. It's that culture change we need to address as a priority, not just across government, but across Scotland. This isn't just about employment support services, and it's not just about the Scottish Government's actions. This needs an all Scotland approach. Nothing short of a, a fundamental shift in how we as a nation approach this will result in the change we want to achieve. I'm clear that this Scottish Government has the leadership role, but this must be a cross-societal effort if we are to succeed. President Officer, people do not live their lives in different compartments. Where we are born, the education and parenting we receive, our experiences as adults, all come together 
to inform how our lives will progress. So in order to address our long-term ambition to ensure that disabled people have access to the same opportunities as everyone else, we also have to address the barriers in all parts of society that we can unwittingly create or have developed over time. And across the Scottish Government, change is happening in key areas such as health, all levels of education and transport through procurement and our work towards inclusive economic growth and fair work with the foundations in place to change the lives of disabled people across Scotland. Looking at health and, and taking mental health as a, a specific example, we put in place a 10-year strategy to improve access to mental health services, backed by an additional £150 million over five years. Helping workplaces to adapt will be an important part of this work. And this morning at the Diversity Conference for Scotland held in Glasgow, I was very pleased to announce the successful bids to the first round of the Workforce a Workplace Equality Fund. Crucially, uh, across the range of projects too, we'll focus on improving understanding and support for mental health in the workplace. Developing new approaches for employers to work with their staff and better support them is key to our work. And I hope the learning from the projects we are funding can be implemented across employers in all sectors. More generally, bringing employability services together with health services is a, a long-held ambition of this government. We know fair work can improve health and well-being but we must also enable people in work to access the help they need quickly should they be at risk of losing their jobs. The Single Health and Employment Gateway pilot, which we are jointly funding with the DWP, which will run in Fife and Dundee from this summer, is an example of the, the type of joined up health and employment support service we believe will help many disabled people to retain employment or to move quickly into work should they lose their job. We're working closely with colleagues in the, the two local authorities, the third sector and Job Centre Plus. Very much the sort of cooperative and joined up delivery model that I want to see more of and that I believe is essential. Looking at education, our focus on excellence and equity in education, including through the Developing Young Workforce strategy, is improving how we prepare young people for learning, life and work. We're working with employers to improve the range and quality of work-related learning opportunities available to all young people, including those with disabilities. The network of 21 employer-led developing young workforce regional groups has an important role to play in this. We can harness this focus to help more disabled young people make successful transitions through learning and into the world of work. Of course, the availability of a job may mean nothing if you, you can't get there. We know that accessible transport is a, a key enabler to ensure that disabled people can access and sustain meaningful employment. Without it, many disabled people quite simply can't get out their front door. The Scottish Government's accessible transport framework can help us towards this. There is more to be done, but again, we have the strategy in place that can support improvement. Looking at how we buy goods and products, we know that procurement is one of our most powerful tools in helping us shape and deliver our ambitions for an inclusive society, one where the benefits of economic prosperity are properly shared. We're making progress here, for example, with the award of a Fair Start Scotland contract to a supporting business through specifically reserving the West contract package area specifically for supported businesses. Yet, as with all other areas, we cannot afford to stand still and we won't stand still. And we must build in our existing work to support employers to achieve and ambitions for inclusive growth and fair work. Evidence shows that diverse workforces are more creative and more innovative. In the, uh, the current climate, with Brexit just around the corner, it is vital that we take the opportunity to tap into a wider range of skills and experience. Employers in all sectors are fundamental to our ambition. Following the First Minister's announcement of up to £1 million towards business the support funding, We'll work in the coming weeks and months to understand better what support is required to help employers recruit and crucially retain disabled people and help them progress their careers. With this, we'll be able to build the type of support and advice service that fully meets their, meets their needs and those of disabled staff. President Officer, all businesses are important to us, but not least those businesses across Scotland and social enterprises who employ many disabled people. We know that uh, some of Scotland's supported businesses who receive funding 
from the UK government through the protected places funding arrangements are deeply concerned about the shift away from the present funding model to one supported through DWP's access to work scheme. I share those concerns. I have pressed the DWP many times now for clarity and the financial impact this will have on those businesses. Paul Wheelhouse, as Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy, has done likewise. Unfortunately, we still await any specific clarity from the UK Government on their intentions. The British Association for Supported Employment has made a representation to the Scottish Government to set up a group to, to seek a Scottish resolution to this matter. It was an officer I can announce today that Paul Wheelhouse and I have agreed that a working group will be set up to look at the impact of the UK Government's changes and consider what support may be required for those organisations across Scotland whose ethos is to recruit a high proportion of disabled people in their workforce. This group will be set up imminently and will include representatives from supported businesses, social firms, trade unions and other expert voices. The presiding officer across the Scottish Government there is support for a Scotland where everyone can flourish. To achieve the ambition of more than having the, the disability employment gap, all areas of government must come together to address the challenge. And in the coming months, that is what will happen as we develop the, the Disability Employment Action Plan announced by the First Minister at last month's Congress, we'll not just develop a series of actions in different government portfolios. We will have a truly cross-government plan that not only sees services coming together to support each other's priorities, but which ultimately helps many more disabled people to fulfil their potential. Elaine Smith. I thank the Minister for taking that intervention on that point. And I just wonder if you would agree with me that uh, we also need to consider that even for those in work, um, there can be relatively high levels of poverty. So, for example, Joseph Rowntree Foundation found that among households in working poverty, three in ten contained a family member with a disability. I think that's an important point, too, that we should consider across portfolios. Jamie Hepburn. I, I would recognise that uh, in work poverty is uh, something that is of, of specific concern to uh, this government through the fair work agenda that we are taking forward. It's something we are determined to tackle, but I recognise uh, the point that uh, Elaine Smith is uh, making. As we uh, develop that uh, cross-government uh, plan, President Officer, we will uh, also send out a call to action uh, across Scotland. This is not just a, a task uh, for the Scottish Government, but one for us all. Uh, to work together to achieve no more or less than a, a transformation in the lives of disabled people across Scotland, the change where everyone recognises the value, skills and talent that disabled people bring to the workplace. A Scotland where all people can feel valued and supported to fulfil their work career and life ambitions. Presiding officer, we have set ourselves on course to complete a significant task, to drastically reduce the disability employment gap by more than half. This is a course I'm determined we will run, and this is a race I'm determined we will win. I call Jamie Halcrow Johnson to speak to and move Amendment 12344.1. Eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, the employment gap uh, between people with disabilities and those without disabilities remains significant and substantial. Fewer than half of the people with disabilities are in employment, compared to well over 80% of those without disabilities. While change has been coming, it's been slow, and the gap remains stubborn. And as overall employment has grown, Increases in disabled work, people in work have not been quick enough to close the gap with the wider labour market. Alongside countries like Germany, Belgium, Ireland and Denmark, the UK still has a disability employment gap that is above the EU average. In Scotland, this is even more pressing. If that all sounds like a bleak assessment, there are some positives to be found. In the last four years, more than 600,000 people with disabilities across the UK have entered the workforce. I mention this particularly given that the UK government has a clear commitment to one million more people with disabilities entering employment in the next decade. This undoubtedly remains a complex problem, and there are a number of areas where government action will help to make a real difference. First, and perhaps most importantly, the views of people with disabilities themselves, as well as, as, well as disability organizations and charities, must be paramount in this debate. We've repeatedly heard that disabled people are able to work, who are able to work want to work, 
and they want to be given support where it is needed to be included in the economy. Because the impact of long-term unemployment is just as keenly felt amongst people with disabilities as it is amongst others. We know all too well the associations with long-term unemployment, poor health outcomes, social isolation, increasing barriers to re-entering the workforce, and reduced self-confidence. There is a litany of negatives that go beyond the economic factors. There's been a, a cross-generational squandering of human potential that we've only recently started to address, to readdress. We must ask ourselves seriously how many people have been unable to break through the barriers that exist to joining the workforce. How many people who could have excelled in their chosen field have been held back, and this must end. Fortunately, there has been a real shift in attitudes. Yes, I will, yes. Gillian Martin. Just to hear what the member is saying around uh, access, people want, with disabilities wanting to work, would you agree with me that that work should always be fair work and would you join us in calling for people to uh, adopt the real living wage for people entering work, whether they are disabled or not? Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Well, as, we, as the point I've just made, the, uh, the UK government has made a real contribution so far in the last four years of bringing 600,000 people in. In terms of looking at the living wage, there's obviously been increases there, and I think a huge amount of progress has already been made, and I'm sure it will continue to be made. Fortunately, there's been a real shift in attitudes towards disabled people in the workplace in our lifetimes. It was only in 1995 that Disability Discrimination Act was brought in, and I'm proud to say by a Conservative government. This was a landmark change in our law and a piece of legislation that set an example to follow internationally. More recently, issues around disability and employment have crossed the tiers of government uh, of, in the UK. Following the Smith Commission, the Scotland Act in 2016 devolved new powers to this chamber. While areas such as access to work programme and, the job centre, and job centre support are reserved, it is clear that both sides must interact to be successful. And we're still in a transitional phase, but I welcome the work that has taken place to build the newly devolved employability programmes. It will be some time before their effectiveness can be measured. In the Fairer Scotland Action Plan on Disability, there is a recognition of some of the work, the other work that has taken place so far. Policies like self-directed um, support, which has gained approval from all sides in this chamber, are a step forward in how disabled access, people access support and public services more widely. I mention this because we in this chamber should be especially aware that the devolved aspect goes deeper than some of the powers that, we've only recently, that have only recently come to this parliament. If we look at official statistics on the types of disability and how they interact with employment, th uh, then there are some perhaps unexpected conclusions to draw. In many cases, physical disability is linked with a higher employment level than other types of disabilities. Depression and anxiety problems have a particularly poor interaction with employment levels. At the very bottom of the conditions analyzed for employment by the DWP are severe or specific learning difficulties where employment rate is under a quarter. Sitting slightly above that at just over 25% is the category of mental illness, phobia, panics, or other nervous disorders. And it was good to hear the minister talk about mental health, as it's clear to me at least that we have a great deal more to do in terms of tackling mental health in the workplace and also improving outcomes for people living with learning difficulties. Mental health has often been mentioned in this chamber, but it's apparent that mental health and its interaction with the labor market is still poorly understood and remains under-supported. We know in the NHS that waiting times can be uh, intolerably lengthy, but just as significantly, there is a limited support for people facing mental health issues in mo most workplaces until they reach crisis point, and too often end up outside of the workforce, even if only temporarily. In terms of people with learning difficulties, we must be asking what sort of support is available to support young people emerging from compulsory education to enter the workplace. To what deg degree is careers advice tailored to fit their needs? To what extent are additional support uh, for learning teachers equipped to support young people into work, in addition to the multitude of other demands on their times and their skills? And how can this possibly be squared with a continuing drop in the number of specialist ASN, ASN teachers in our schools? This is a process that has continued for several years, while the number of school pupils identified as having additional support needs has grown significantly. In our schools, there remains a problem with disability of all types, when we debated this subject on the 16th of May last year, my colleague Adam Tompkins quoted Bill Scott of Inclusion Scotland in his evidence to the Social Security Committee. To refresh the Parliament's memory, Mr Scott told us, there are disabled children with sensory impairments and physical impairments, but no intellectual impairment whatsoever, who are leaving school with no qualifications. That makes their chances nil in the current job market. 
Unless we change that, we'll not change their future. Whatever changes we can make now, it is clear that we have failed many, great many pupils as they have made their way through the education system. I've previously called for a lifelong approach to skills, and for people with disabilities especially, this is vitally important to correct historic wrongs. In all that we do, there must be the impetus to build personalized public services that can cater the needs of people with disabilities, allow them to access opportunities, and pursue their own chosen path in life. Employers also, uh, are also a key to driving the change. The Disability Confident campaign now involves 6,000 employers across the United Kingdom working to improve their approach to disability. This includes over 60 organizations here in Edinburgh, as well as a good number in my own region across the public and private sectors. And we know that remote communities can have particular problems when we discuss labor markets, not to mention the issues faced by the predominantly smaller businesses that populate the highlands and islands. All layers of government and their agencies have a role to play. So I welcome the recent consultation on disabled employment in the public sector, mentioned in my amendment. In his introduction, um, the minister writes that only one in nine employees in Scotland's public sector are disabled against almost one fifth of the working age population. That is unacceptable. And we'll be looking at closely at the proposals which the Scottish government brings forward to address that. Presiding officer, this debate often strays beyond employability. It is, at least in part, one about the culture of delivering public services, about problems that can arise long before people enter the labor market, and how health care and work interact. We must create a society where the skills and abilities of people with disabilities are realized by our education system, by employers, and by the state. A society where young, people, young disabled person can look forward with confidence to the prospect of obtaining skills or finding a job, and not the fear that their ambitions will be thwarted. To do that, we need deeper and faster change than we have already seen. I move the amendment in my name. I call Roger Grant to speak to and move amendment 12344.2. Seven minutes, please. We all want to work. It's part of us. It makes us who we are and it helps us define ourselves. We all need a purpose, a way to contribute to society and a way to enable us to be independent and self-reliant. And that's why work is so important. There are one million pe people in Scotland with disabilities, but only 42% of them are employed. And you can only imagine the frustration of the other 58%. The government motion is worthwhile. There's nothing in it that we can't support, but we need to go further. We cannot simply hope to close the employment gap for disabled people through wishful thinking because it won't happen on its own. The only way it'll happen is if we make it happen. We need to take action to make it happen. We need to set targets and to monitor that action if we're to achieve them. Our amendment calls for targets and progress reports to Parliament. If we do this, we can ensure that progress is being made and that we can concentrate minds on what needs to happen. I don't want to hear a debate in this Parliament in 10 years' time still making the same points as we're making today. We also want the UK as a whole to do better by disabled people. To be picked out for criticism by the UN is simply not good enough. We need to be leading on this issue. In their report, the UN said that the Conservative government had committed grave systematic violations of the rights of persons with disabilities. And this was partly due to their closure of Remploy re re factories. We need more of those placements, not less. There are many hurdles for disabled people that they have to overcome to find work and discrimination and false perceptions are part of that. Sometimes it seems it's just too hard for employers to go that extra mile to remove the barriers that society puts in place to make life harder for people with disabilities. Why pay to fit a ramp when you can employ someone who just doesn't need it? Why take time to make ad adaptations to a workstation when you can just employ someone who doesn't need them? Why put in additional support systems when you could just employ somebody who doesn't need it? And these attitudes mean we all lose out. We don't, often don't expand our knowledge of the challenges faced and we miss out on enriching our own lives with their experience. This also stops disabled people being able to contribute to society and to live fulfilling lives. I was fortunate to be one of the first MSPs to take part in the Inclusion Scotland parliamentary internship programme. And this pays for interns and places them with MSPs to gain work experience. 
I had the pleasure of um, having Ryan McMullen as my intern, and some of you may have met him. You certainly wouldn't have forgotten him if you had. He had cerebral palsy and making that made his speech difficult to understand. He was absolutely undaunted and was a real asset to our office. However, I know I learned more than he did from that internship. Initially, we had to find adaptations and look at technology to allow him to do things like answer the phone. I then became aware of people who didn't know him were sometimes very awkward around him and that was something that was very obvious to him. Working with someone with a disability taught me that you simply need to take the time to find out how to work alongside them. And if you do that, we all benefit. The trouble with fear of the unknown is it can lead to discrimination and that discrimination leads to further discrimination. And the best way to overcome the fear of the unknown is to make it known. The best way to show that disabled people can carry out everyday jobs is to give them that opportunity. And it will only be when we all know disabled people in the workplace and educate ourselves that any fear and with it the discrimination will reduce. To do this, we need positive discrimination. We have the powers and the ability to make change. The public sector is a huge employer and we need to take positive action to ensure that we employ disabled people in at least the proportion that they are in our communities. And we could do this by ensuring that quali qualified disabled people are guaranteed an interview for a job, that we set targets for levels of employment and the like. And this is even more important for those with learning disabilities. There are many fantastic organisations in their communities that offer work training and this supports people with learning disabilities to learn these jobs at their own speed and at their, in their own time and then they can do them as well as anybody else. And there are organisations such as the Shirley Project and Artisans in Inverness in my region but indeed there are many more and many who have sent us briefings ahead of this debate who take time to do that in their own communities. Last week, I met Apex Scotland in the Highlands, who have traditionally provided services to get offenders back to work. They discovered that most of those they were dealing with had drug and alcohol problems, and that's what had got them into trouble in the first place. And those addictions came from them having poor mental health. They started working with people before they offended, people with drug and alcohol problems or people whose mental health was poor. And by working with them, they've ensured they don't end up in the criminal justice system. But they find another way to deal with their problems. They help them get employment and thereby build satisfying and stable lives for themselves. These organisations work intensively with people. And this takes time and it takes money, but the reward more than makes up for it. Not only the personal reward for the individual, but the reward of a good staff member for a business and the economic reward of allowing people to contribute their expertise to society as a whole. Disability Agenda Scotland in their report, End the Gap, urged the public sector to take the lead through their own employment practice, but also by using procurement policies to ensure we only contract with businesses who have disabled friendly employment practices. They point out that disabled people are more likely to be lower paid and underemployed as well. And when you take into account that the cost to a disabled person on average is an additional £550 a month simply to live, that is even worse. We can't just focus on getting more disabled people into the workforce. We must also make sure that we support them when we get them there. Um, so Disabled Agenda Scotland's report found that a huge 64% of disabled people in work felt at risk of losing their job. We have to make a step change on how we deal with people with disabilities. We have to acknowledge that there are many barriers to face that have been put up by society that does not understand and has largely ignored their needs. We must break down these barriers and allow them to gain employment and have the same career ch chances as the rest of us. We all want to live in an equal society and this is one way that we can do it. I move the amendment, Minnie. I call Alison Johnson, six minutes please. Thank you, presiding officer. I very much welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate and I welcome too the government's ambition to half the disability employment gap. 
Um, there is consensus across the Chamber that the fact that disabled people in Scotland are almost half as likely to be in employment than non-disabled people is not acceptable. Devolution has allowed us to build a much fairer Scotland in many ways, but there is much more to be done to ensure our economy and society are inclusive of everyone. Disabled people have been on the receiving end of an extraordinary onslaught of welfare reforms in recent years. And these have, as Rhoda Grant's motion notes, systematically violated the rights of disabled people. In particular, their right to work is being violated by reforms which make it more difficult to find and keep employment. As of April last year, new claimants of the Employment Support Allowance work-related activity component will get £30 less a week than they would have previously. That's around £15,000 a year less. People in this position will get the same as standard job seekers allowance or the universal credit equivalent. The rationale for this is that the additional money act, acted as a disincentive to work. But that argument fails to recognise that a disabled person faces more barriers to work and is likely to be unemployed for longer than someone who is unemployed with no other barriers. And indeed, the cut was based on a 2005 OECD study that benefit cuts create a work incentive despite that research not being focused on disabled people. The Having the Gap report from former Paralympic athlete Tani Gray Thompson commissioned to investigate the impact of the cut on the aim of having the disability employment gap found, and I quote, there is no relevant research setting out a convincing case that the £30 a week employment support allowance um, work-related activity group payment acts as a financial disincentive to claimants moving towards work. The proposed reduction in the financial support to this group is likely to move them further away from the labour market rather than closer. This is not evidence-based policy making. Disabled people have been hit disproportionately by the cruel system of benefit sanctions. And just today, the results of a five-year study into benefit conditionality have been published the research conducted by six universities, including Glasgow and Heriot Watt, concluded that benefit sanctions have no tangible positive effects in moving disabled people closer to work. They routinely trigger profoundly negative personal, financial and health impacts that are likely to move disabled people further away from the paid labour market. I'm proud that Greens led the way in ensuring sanctions have no place in devolved employment programmes, but there's a long way to go until we have a system of benefits based on supporting people into work and not bullying them. And on the issue of employment programmes to help disabled people into work, the Scottish Government has made a promising start. To their credit, it has sought to plug the huge gap in funding that was created by the UK Government just before the employment programmes were devolved. However, I do have some queries about the support offered to disabled people as part of the new Fair Start Scotland scheme um, that the Minister may be able to offer assurances on when he closes the debate. Um, according to the Scottish Union of Supported Employment, the Fair Start provider guidance says that eligibility will depend on whether the individual is ready for work within 12 months or 18 months for people requiring more support. Therefore, I'd be grateful if the Minister could outline what support is on offer for disabled individuals who wish to return to work, but whose journey back into employment might be longer than 12 to 18 months. And I think it would also be useful if the Minister could clarify the role of individual placement and support within Fair Start Scotland. IPS is a voluntary approach which places people into jobs quickly and then provides support both to the person and the employer. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests that this is a really effective type of employment support for people with additional barriers to employment. However, um, certainly, certainly... Jamie Hepburn. To absolutely reassure her on the, the latter, of course, it's a contractual commitment from every provider that they must provide the IPS uh, model and in terms of her first point the support employment model is also Im embedded in there uh, of course the program is uh, deliberately designed on the basis that uh, a person can be supported over 12 to 18 months but there will be other support out there for those whose journey takes longer. Alison Johnson. I, I thank the Minister for his response. He will be aware however that, that Sam H withdrew from the West Fair Start Scotland contract in March um, citing concerns about whether the funding model can ever properly support IPS, with the organisation's chief executive saying 
that we cannot see how it's possible for any organisation to deliver IPS properly within the funding structure that currently exists for Fair Start Scotland. And Disability Agenda 2 has also expressed concerns that there is little detail on how IPS will be offered or accredited by Fair Start providers. And presiding officer, as Jamie Halcrow Johnston uh, mentions in his amendment, people with learning difficulties face particular barriers to employment. The UK Work Choice programme supported far fewer such individuals than previous employment programmes, and I'd welcome the Minister's assurance that Fair Start Scotland will be fully supporting people with learning difficulties. As much as work can be a positive force in our lives, many Scots work in jobs that don't promote healthy working practices or an appropriate work-life balance, and so we're faced with a significantly increasing number of people who leave work for health reasons, particularly poor mental health. Um, and I question whether the disability plan properly takes into account the broader economic transformation Scotland needs for all Scots, both disabled and non-disabled people. Presiding officer, I will close. Um, but in concluding, we are agreed that disabled people face a huge number of barriers to work, discrimination, workplaces and work practices that are exclusionary, and a UK benefit system that, while saying all the time is trying to help disabled people into work, is in fact making it even harder. I very much welcome the Scottish Government's ambition to, ha to half the disability employment gap, but that ambition must, and I hope will, be matched with radical action. Thank you. Alex Cole Hamilton, six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by echoing thanks to the Scottish Government for securing time for this important issue today uh, and for the opposition amendments, which we'll be supporting in full. Um, given that nearly 60% of working-age Scots who have a disability are out of work, the ambition to close that employability gap, or employment gap, rather, is, is vital. But we are somewhat swimming against the tide, given that those who are in work are in professions which are known to be in decline. So we have our work cut out. Taken in isolation, as a comparator, we would have the third highest of uh, EU member states in terms of the employability, employment gap. And that matters. It matters for three key reasons, because it matters because unemployment reduces the orbit of your social universe. It uh, reduces the social connectivity that you have. It matters because it reduces your financial independence. And it matters very much because it reduces your feelings of self-worth and thereby your physical and mental health can deteriorate also, we absolutely support the government motion and its efforts in this. This is an, an area which should be devoid of party politics. And we have a social and a moral imperative as a parliament to do better than we have been doing. So I absolutely support the um, ambition to develop an action plan, to set targets, to reduce stigma, to improve accessibility in the workplace environment. I also want to uh, adopt a word that has been fostered by inclusion, which is around the the idea of employability. We all know about employability for people with disabilities, but we need to equip employers to be better able to serve them once they come onto the payroll. That is all too often forgotten about. And I think that the one million pound uh, grant or, or award that is being made by the Scottish Government will be going some way to addressing that. Let's begin though, uh, let's recognize though, that disadvantage for people with disabilities starts right out of the traps in terms of primary school around the expectations that our young people with disabilities are fostered to have in terms of what they can expect out of life and the careers they can progress into that will impact on where they're streamed and the, the kind of groups they're put in. Accessibility in school is still not 100%. We are still having physical barriers to learning for people uh, with disabilities in our classrooms and social exclusion comes with that as well, that people with disabilities, children with disabilities are far less to have the kind of um, social uh, networks that their uh, able-bodied counterparts are likely to have, and with that, the lifelong links that can benefit uh, people throughout their careers. That continues at university. And I, at this point, reference the work of the Equal Opportunities and Human Rights Committee, Equalities and Human Rights Committee, which I'm vice convener. When we, as part of our budget scrutiny last year, were very interested in the efforts of the uh, higher education sector to make learning accessible to students with disability and very structured to learn that, for example, in terms of 
BSL, British Sign Language. There is only one university in the whole of the United Kingdom which is accredited as a BSL-friendly learning experience, is that, and that is Lancaster. I think we need to ensure that our tertiary education institutions learn the lessons of that uh, institution, because obviously all of these um, your, your social mobility is very much affected by the learning that you have under your belt before you attempt to enter the workplace. So we can set targets, and that's important, but we need to stand those up with meaningful action if they are missed. Now, I think that I may be one of the only people in this room who had the misfortune to read all 32 single outcome agreements when they were first launched in 2009. That was part of my job at the time, but I was always struck in terms of measuring progress for people with disability going into employment. That one of the largest local authorities in Scotland set the lofty ambition of uh, getting 200 young people between the ages of 16 and 21 with a disability into the workplace by the following year. The following year came, they reported on that, and that 200 target was missed by 189. They only got 11 people into that, uh, in, into work as a result of that. But nothing happened. Nothing happened. They didn't lose any funding. They didn't face any sanction, and they weren't. They didn't. Uh, attempt to redress that with the following year's single outcome agreement. So targets matter, but we have to stand them up with accountability and with action. Now, we also talk the language of stigma. We talk about stigma in almost every debate around the equalities agenda in this chamber, and that's absolutely right. But Sam H., and they've been referenced in the last contribution, uh, published a report that said that 40% of employers would not employ somebody if they had a mental health issue of any kind. That's the, the, the sort of nexus of where we've got to take this debate and recognise the mountain we have to climb ahead of us. Um, we also recognise that once people are in work with disabilities, they still face barriers. There is an a, a, a disability pay gap which exists. Inclusion Scotland, again, uh, revealed that there, that can be as much as £1.20 an hour compared to able-bodied counterparts. Now, we just recently passed the Gender Representation on Public Boards Act, and I'm very proud to have been part of that, and I'm glad that achieved unanimous support. But we need to be sure that our boards look more like the society in which they operate, not just for gender, but for equalities issues as well, such as disability. Because when the strategic management uh, of an organization looks like a society, if it's rights literate, accessibility literate, then only then will the organization or the company uh, around it be so as well. Now, I want to finish, Deputy Presiding Officer, with the, the words of Helen Keller, who's probably known to everybody in this chamber, when she said, I am conscious of a soul sense that lifts me above the narrow, cramping circumstances of my life. My world lies upward. Now, people with disability are capable of ambition like any of us. It is only the physical limitations of the environment around them and the attitudes of those who might otherwise employ them which stand in their way. We have the ability to change both in this chamber. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and it's speeches of five minutes, please. And I call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Presiding officer, when we talk about the employment gap, we can tend to focus on what we perceive to be the employability issues of individuals with disabilities. How should they change? What more do they need to learn? What extra support can be provided? Whilst employability programmes are crucial for some of our citizens furthest away from work, actually, if we're serious about having the disability employment gap and bringing an additional 120,000 disabled people into the workforce and retaining those who are currently in work, we have to acknowledge that a large part of the problem is societal. The Poverty Alliance have highlighted findings from their community engagement that almost all participants reported the biggest challenge to disabled people's employment was perceptions and myths. The myth that disabled people are generally less productive, the myth that they're more likely to have time off sick, the myth that they're likely to be a health and safety hazard at work, and the myth that they're expected not to stay in a job long term. Of course, some disabled people will not be able to work, to do certain kinds of work or to work for long periods, but many, many more are ready and willing. And for those folk, it's not about the individual's lack of skills or education. It's not about someone's inability to manage a condition or their lack of confidence or motivation. It's about stigma, poor attitudes, discriminatory cultures, policies and processes. We need to address these barriers in the path of disabled people. We need to address employers failing to make reasonable adjustments to workplaces because of fear of costs or lack of awareness. 
We need to address discriminatory policies and practices and assumptions about what a person can and cannot do. These barriers are a product of other people's attitudes, not about the disabled person themselves, but a reflection on our society. We have to change the way that our society thinks about disability and employment. We have to do that because it's the right thing to do in terms of equality and fairness, but it's also the right thing to do because if we don't, we will miss out on talent, diversity and richness. And that's good for no one. It's no good for individuals, organisations or society. To mark International Disabled People's Day, Inclusion Scotland launched My Work Story, a social media campaign to encourage disabled people to get talking about being disabled at work, what helps them feel comfortable and confident and what gets in the way. They started a conversation about everyday experiences in the workplace and what employers can do to make it easy for disabled people to be themselves and ask for and get the adjustments that they need. Jay, who took part, said, I've been working for many years now in different industries and the reactions are always the same. Oh no, you poor dear, what have you done? Ouch. Didn't think you'd be able to do that, etc. A lot of well-meaning if tad ignorant comments about how they didn't notice I was disabled straight away and how brave I am for still working. Ethan also spoke to the challenges he faced and I quote, there was help when I transitioned from walking to using my wheelchair. But in terms of being flexible around hours and workplace assessments, I didn't access these things and didn't know what I could ask for. There was certainly no one that took on res the responsibility of telling me about these things. There isn't a menu stuck up on the wall that tells you what adjustments could be made. So you don't know yourself what to ask for. Employers don't anticipate. Providing examples of adjustments is so important. Presiding officer, to close the disability gap, we have to start to address the barrier of negative attitudes and exclusive practices. Employers need to change to become more accessible and inclusive. We need a focus on what inclusion Scotland call employerability. All employers can take positive steps to employ, retain and promote more disabled people. Inclusion Scotland's report of the Disabled People's Annual Summit contains a very useful table of essential and desirable criteria for employers. I commend the report to the Chamber and to all employers, no matter what the size of their organisation, and encourage them to do all they can to ensure that they're not missing out on the ideas, talent and expertise of disabled people. Presiding officer. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by George Adam. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think we've uh, heard the figures and we've heard many uh, already very positive contributions by our speakers. I think there are a number of myths out there, myths within those who are employers, but also myths within the disability community and even with those with disability. I think the first myth is, is uh, the private sector is bad, the public sector is good. And I think that's a myth that we have to be careful we don't buy into. Because if you look at local authorities um, and NHS, how many disabled people have made it to chief executive or to directors or to even senior positions within councils? For my uh, brief uh, looking over the last few days, the answer is very few. And the myth that public sector have got it right is simply not correct. Even as we look around this place this afternoon, we are well short of any target that we might be setting other people. And perhaps we ourselves as political parties and as a parliament need to get ourselves in order before we preach too much to others. The second myth is that employers don't want to employ disabled people. I don't think that is the case in most cases. But I think employers are generally scared sometimes of employing disabled people. They're scared that they will ask the wrong question, that they won't be able to make the reasonable adjustments that are required, that they uh, won't be able to deal with the individual if it simply doesn't work out. It was interesting, I was speaking to uh, a large employer here within Edinburgh, and they say, they welcome the different protected characteristics, but it does also cause them issues.
because on one hand we're trying to make sure that the workforce is, is correct in regard to people's sexuality, or in regard to gender balance, or in regard to age, but they find it difficult to hold them all together and to give each one the correct um, emphasis that it requires. And I do think that uh, we have to be careful that in a politically correct society, and that is something to be welcomed, that we don't go too far, that we stop employers being put off by simply not being willing to ask the right question. Absolutely. Ruth McGuire. I thank Jeremy Balfour for taking intervention. He mentioned that as political parties, we could probably do better in being a bit more representative. Would he support affirmative action to make sure that our parties are more representative of the people that we're serving? Jeremy Balfour. I should probably declare an interest at this point. Um, I mean, I, I, I want to be here, and I'm sure each member wants to be here, because they believe they're the right, best person to get elected, whether they've got a disability, not got a disability, whether they're male, female, whatever. So I am slightly wary, personally, of that, because I think it can end up with tokenism, although perhaps it might be welcome that if you are elected to this place, you can't be thrown out if you've got a disability. But seriously, I think we just have to be slightly careful that uh, we don't do it as a token way, but I think it's something we need to explore. Why are more, in a second, yet, yeah, why are more disabled people not coming forward. And it was interesting, in a conference I attended in Canada last year on disability and politics, the reason seemed to be not the electorate, but it was how you get into your political party and how you get yourself, um, if you like, known in that political party with a disability was a big issue. Ruth McGuire. Appreciate him letting me come back in. That's very generous. I just, my question is something that I've asked one of your colleagues before in terms of gender um, equality. How long are you willing to wait for your, the, our chamber to represent the people that we they represent to reflect better? Jeremy Balfour. If I can talk that by simply saying I've only got 45 seconds and it's a big issue uh, to discuss. Can I make two very quick uh, closing points about the presiding officer? Firstly, uh, and one thing I would ask the Scottish Government maybe to work with DWP and the UK government, and I would say the same to the UK government, is for many employers, it will be maybe once in five years that they employ a disabled person. And at the moment, there's the UK website, there's the Scottish Parliament website, there's lots of other websites. And, and I do think it would be really helpful if we could have one website where all the information could be found from both north and south of the border, um, and it would make it easier for employers. The final thing is, and I did say at the start, I do think there's a myth that sometimes disabled people feel uh, that they are being discriminated against. Um, and sometimes that will be the case, but sometimes it won't be. I was interested in the minister uh, in his closing remarks, and I think this is where words are important, said each, each disabled person should be allowed to achieve what they want. Well, I think we just have to be slightly careful with that. I understand what he's saying, I under understand. But if I had been at 16 said to the person at school, I would quite like to be a juggler, that might have caused some issues. Or for someone with my disability, it might be difficult to be a surgeon. I suspect not too many of you would welcome me at A&E on a Saturday night. And that is where I think there does need to be realism. But yes, we do want to encourage disabled people to be all they can be. And I've been very privileged that with my parents, with my school, with my university, within my party, I've been encouraged to do that. But I think we also have to be realistic. There are some jobs that disabled people cannot do. And we have to waken up to that and acknowledge that, while at the same time allowing people to do all they can be within their disability. Thank you very much. I call George Adam to be followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to speak in this debate today. Personally, I'm feeling very strongly about today's motion and the Scottish Government's desire to close the employability gap. Perhaps more than most, I understand the barriers and difficulties disabled people often face when entering the workforce and the challenges they experience on a daily basis when undertaking employment. This is because, as many of you know, my wife Stacey has multiple sclerosis, and I see how she deals with that fight against that horrible disease every single day. And it's also because 
uh, of where I live, because I live in an area which technically is called an SIMD 20 area. It's mainly because that every one of the tenemental properties in the bottom half of the uh, street are all disabled and accessible housing. And for that reason, because of 60% of people with disability are unemployed, you end up with a situation where you end up becoming an area of deprivation. And one of the things I want to mention is the MS Society brought up when they were talking about, uh, they did a fantastic uh, briefing for us today. And MS affects 11,000 Scots, presiding officer, and you're diagnosed between 20 and 30 years of age, which is key working years. It's years when everybody should be either out in university or out in the workplace, earning for the future. But with MS, that becomes very difficult, and it's made even more difficult when employers have an attitude with someone who actually has, says, I've been recently diagnosed with MS. I've got one example here from someone with MS that said shortly after, they said shortly after being diagnosed, 18 months, my employer sacked me, citing the MS as the reason. I was told you'll get a lot worse, your illness will cost me money, and hiring in temporary staff to cover will cost us too much. So we can talk about working with employers to ensure that they make things better, but they have to take on responsibility. And when Mr uh, Balfour says, you know, we can't say public sector good, uh, private sector bad, well, I'm waiting for private sector to actually give the type of support that they need, because I am aware that a lot of public sector organisations do, although not perfect, do provide that support. And I think that we as parliamentarians need to continue to speak out and push these barriers to be knocked down so that as to make one long-term permanent and fulfilling employment as accessible as possible for everyone in Scotland. Employability plays an essential role in delivering the Scottish Government's aims of tackling poverty, supporting inclusive growth and promoting social justice. And it's an integral component in the fairer and more prosperous Scotland we all want to see. Being, in a, being a socially just and people-oriented society is at the heart of the Scottish Government policy and a staunch commitment to equality and supporting those who often feel disenfranchised and isolated is an essential part of our country's modern identity. And I'm sure we all agree that disabled people make a, diff a significant contribution to Scottish society and bring a wealth of talent, diversity and richness to our communities. Yet, only, they, although they only make up 20% of Scotland's population, disabled people only account for 11% of the private sector workforce and 11.7% of the public sector staff. In numerical terms, that's over a million disabled people in Scotland, but only 284,000 are in employment. These figures are alarming and clearly indicate there are an enormous amount of talent and skill being underused, just waiting to be harnessed. Through the creation of a fair and open, transparent social security system and a continued drive to implement policy that, above all, upholds the principles of dignity and respect, it is cl equally clear that these benches are committed to supporting those furthest from the labour market and those at risk of long-term unemployment and work. Most of the barriers that disabled people face are a product of other people's attitudes and a reflection of the many biases that unfortunately still plague our society. The target is therefore half the disability employment gap is hugely challenging and will require a transformation in the way our society thinks about disability and employment. The Scottish Government is committed to changing these attitudes and to lead by example. The access to elected office fund already is place, provides uh, financial support to help disabled people overcome the extra difficulties they may face in striving for and then undertaking an elected position. And in the recent local government elections alone, over 39 candidates were supported, and with 15 of them elected as councillor. This fund is an area of personal importance to me, as my sister, councillor Jennifer Adam McGregor, was one of the candidates who received unrivalled support and now is a proud member of Remshire Council. Jennifer Adam may be many things, but she is not a pro product of tokenism, and this is something Jeremy Balfour should reflect on. Yes. Oliver Mundell. I fully support the points the member makes. I actually think he makes the same point as Jeremy Balfour ultimately. Uh, I think schemes uh, like the one uh, supported by Inclusion Scotland that the member mentions should be tried first uh, before we introduce uh, quotas or set targets. Making sure that people have the right support in the first place. Is that not the answer to getting more people into politics? Another 30 seconds or so. Disabled people have the difficulty getting access as it is to employability or to anything else within our society. In order to make that uh, societal change, we need to make these quotas. We need to ensure that this place 
actually covers everybody in our society. And I don't agree with Mr. Balfour saying, because I've heard this for decades, that talent is talent first and everything else later. I don't believe that disabled people do not have the talent to be here. They just don't have the actual support to be here. And that's the main issue that we have in this scenario. So, presiding officer, with all that in mind, I always choose to look to the positives as we go forward. And I'm proud to be part of a parliament and a country that stands up for everyone in society and continually strives to break down barriers and as opposed to putting them up. The current disability employment gap of 37.4% is unacceptable and the Scottish Government endeavours to at least half this percentage. This will certainly be challenging, but placing dignity, fairness and respect at the heart of the agenda, I think this Scottish Government is showing it's up to the task. Alex Rowley, followed by Julian Martin. President officer, today's debate on tackling the employment gap for disabled people is very important, given that there are over a million disabled people in Scotland. Research shows that disabled people experience lower rates of employment and lower pay than non-disabled people. As Disability Agenda Scotland have said, some disabled people are not able to work, but for other people working where possible can have economic and social benefits for not only the individual, but the people around them and beyond. And many disabled people wish to work, yet there are many barriers to enter the labour market, not just physical, developmental or related to their mental health, but also in terms of societal and employer attitudes. Given the the 42% of working-age disabled people in Scotland are in work, and that for non-disabled people this figure rises to around 80%. The difference, which is now 35.8%, tells us that something must be done. The recently published report from Inclusion Scotland, Situations Vacant, Employer Ability and Disabled People's Right to Work looked at many issues and I was struck by the introduction which stated, and I quote, we believe that there is a vacancy to be filled by employers to improve their employer ability as good employers for us. We also believe that our right to work needs to be better recognised and addressed by all concerned. The introduction in the report goes on to say, of course, some disabled people will not be able to work, to do certain types of work or to work for long periods. And some are now so far removed from the labour market that it will take years of support to get close to it again. However, many more of us are ready and willing to work. We believe that for the actions to have the right impact, we, disabled people, need to co-produce the design and delivery of them in partnership with others. And I do want to briefly pick up on that point, that for some people, they are not able to work, and this must always be recognised. And people who are not able to work should be able to get the support that they need. Here in Scotland, we must do all in our power to ensure we never find ourselves in the situation where the United Nations publishes a report stating that the government, in this case, the UK Conservative government, have committed, and I quote, grave systematic violations of the rights of persons with disabilities. This was a damning indictment of the treatment by the Conservative government of disabled people, one which should shame us as a country and is why today's debate and the policy approach in Scotland is so important. Jamie Harker Johnson. I thank the member for taking an intervention on that. Would he also recognise the UN Committee said at a national level it appears that the welfare system, together with the social and healthcare system, provides a solid base for the protection of the rights of persons with disabilities? Alec Rowley. There's a further report out today that, that shows clearly that the welfare reform carried out by the Conservative government not only failed disabled people, it failed the government, it failed the economy. As Sally Witcher, the CEO of Inclusion Scotland, said, most people need to work and poverty is not a great way of incentivising people to do so. In fact, it makes it harder. So for those who cannot work, there must be respect and there must be dignity. For those far removed from the labour market, there needs to be greater recognition of their needs with programmes of support designed and delivered with the very people they aim to support. 
but we should also be aware that the economic and social benefit to us all if we can achieve the goal of cutting the employment gap for disabled people. Research from the Social Market Foundation has estimated that half in the disability employment gap in the UK and supporting one million more disabled people into work would boost the economy by £13 billion a year. As the Poverty Alliance state, we should do all we can to debunk the myths that disabled people are less productive as it is simply not the case. A recent survey showed that 15% of disabled people felt they had been discriminated against when applying for a job, and one in five while they were in work. This is why the government works, must work with employers to overcome such issues and, where necessary, introduce stronger laws and proper enforcement of the Equality Act. We now need to get on with this work, for it is the right thing to do for Scotland. Thank you, Mr Rowley. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Ms Martin, please. For Scotland to reach its social and economic potential, then we've got to provide opportunities for everyone to have the chance of fair and fulfilling work. And the current disability employment gap is simply unacceptable. Combined with the support being offered by the new social security system in Scotland, hitting the target of having the gap will make a huge difference to people's lives and our wider society. We need to get in early to help people with disabilities or health conditions to stay in or move into work. And I asked the Scottish Government in November last year what work was being done to ensure that early support was available to people with health and disability issues. And I was pleased to hear from the Minister for Employability and Training that the Scottish Government would contribute £630,000 to a pilot for single health and work gateway, which will run until 2020 and provide that early support. The pilot will have links to Fair Start Scotland, so the disabled people or people with health conditions who face the more severe barriers to work get referred to the right place. And I also welcome the Workplace Equality Fund, which gives grants to employers to eliminate or reduce barriers to employment. Um, we want to close the gap, but we can't do that without employers. And, and George Adams is right. I mean, um, grants are fine, but actually it's attitudes that are going to be the biggest change and need to be the biggest change. Um, I'm particularly concerned, though, that there are not enough opportunities for work for young adults with learning disabilities in my area. And I know from friends who've got sons and daughters with autism and other additional support needs, how worried they are about them leaving school and what lies ahead of them in the future. So I welcome the continued support of the Scottish Government to support Project SEARCH, a transition programme for people with learning disabilities and autistic spectrum conditions in the last year of education. In 2012, the Scottish Government adopted this programme, which originated in Cincinnati in the US. In my area, the University of Aberdeen, in collaboration with Inspire, NESCOL, Skills Development Scotland, as well as both the City and Shire Councils, recruits 12 interns per year. And so far, 68% of the recruits have gained employment across Grampian. Anything we can do to increase the recruit intake would be greatly welcome because although for those 12 interns, this is a tremendous opportunity, I am pretty sure that there'll be more than 12 people would like to apply. The continuation of Scotland's employer recruitment incentive is also a positive step and provides £4,000 of funding to a company when they take on a, a, an eligible employee. Um, but I, I also worry that the removal of the Protected Places scheme by the UK government is out of step with this positive programme and it could lead to many hard-fought hard uh, job losses. I also want to recognise the work of Inclusion Scotland in providing advice and consultancy from those with disabilities on the barriers that can and should be removed to make the world of work more accessible and for delivering the disability and internship programme which uh, has 120 employment opportunities in the public and third sector. And it's the third sector that I want to turn to. Um, we must support and recognise the third sector's work in setting up social enterprises which give training and employment to many young adults with additional support needs. And I'd like to pay tribute to some organisations in my constituency which provide that support and training. Inspires a charity which as well as been a collaborator in Project Search in the North East provides the Inspire Academy and their 10-week course gives people with additional support needs the opportunity to develop employability skills and get hands-on experience in the workplace. 
And then there's Fly Cup Catering based in Inverurie, which provides adults with learning disabilities with training. Since 2000, uh, the year 2000, it's helped dozens probably hundreds actually, of young adults with learning disabilities into employment in the catering and hospitality sector. Each trainee has a programme tailored to their individual needs and they can achieve nationally recognised qualifications. And it does, but the, the Fly Cup does have quite a, late, a waiting list, which comes back to my earlier point, that the, the demand outstrips the supply for good quality training and work opportunities. Then there's Benchmark and Ellen and Woods Recyclability in Pitt Meadon, um, and they work with the, both councils to provide adults with learning disabilities opportunities to work. And Can Do in Ellen are a community recycling organisation. They also make the best bedding plants that don't die when you put them into your garden. I can vouch for that. The work done by social enterprises such as these is vital to offering adults with learning disabilities a path into the world of work. Their dedication, combined with the strategic plans and funding of the Scottish Government and their partner organisations, will make the goal of having a disability employment gap achieve achievable. But I agree with so many people in this chamber that we need employers to step up to. Thank you. I call Alexander Stewart, to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am delighted to be able to take part in today's debate. It's vitally important that we discuss these issues, and I'm encouraged by many of the contributions so far. Prior to becoming an MSP, I spent almost two decades working closely with individuals with disabilities and learning difficulties, and it opened my eyes to the constant struggle that they endured on a day-to-day -day basis. Indeed, this past involvement and experience was recognised when I had the opportunity to open the Making Where We Live Better conference last year, which was organised by Perth and Canross Council. I was able to call on my experience and knowledge of private landlords, local authorities and employers in many parts of Scotland whose current operating practices are apparently lack of awareness can affect those learning uh, individuals with learning difficulties. Uh, and they are the individuals that want to see and want to have that independent life. To this end, I fully understand the importance of discussing and raising awareness of many of the discriminatory issues which face these people living with a disability. That is why it is vitally important that we acknowledge the work that's been done by businesses, by charities and independent groups, and that across my region as well as other parts of Scotland, because that contribution that they make is vitally important to ensuring that we have much more of a greater justice for these individuals. My own party, the Scottish Conservatives, do support the delivery of fairness in the workplace. And I'm sure we can all agree that we should ensure that there are no barriers to people with disability entering the work market. But more has to be done. We've heard already today about the difficulties about travel, the difficulties about application forms, and also interviews. Uh, and I'm delighted that it was the Conservatives back in 1995 that passed the Disability Discrimination Act because it did put a marker down. As it also focuses on employment, it's important that we echo uh, the words that my colleague Adam Tompkins talked about when he spoke about a debate uh, back in December of 2016. He talked about uh, the great stories of modern Britain where we have more jobs available in our economy than ever before. That Britain now sees uh, more women employed uh, and more people with disabilities having the opportunity, but we still have further to go. We must acknowledge that. We still have further to go. In December 2016, there were nearly half a million more since 2013 and 360,000 more than just two years ago. But Scotland, Deputy Presiding Officer, still has a long way to go. We are not there yet and we need to catch up. Many employers seemingly paying lip service to employing these individuals uh, in menial tasks. And as I said, I saw that myself, individuals who got the opportunity to go in, but they didn't get the potential. They, they were given tasks that maybe didn't actually stretch them far enough. Uh, and they became bored and they became frustrated by all that. We should be doing more to encourage them to unlock their potential. It's a terrible injustice that, that we have this and we have to ensure that the gap uh, that is being dealt with is halved. And I think that it's very good that we have this halving of the disability employment gap. Uh, and many organisations, including the Law Society, have made some issues. The Law Society indicated that issues of disability employment gap in Scotland is a pressing concern. 
they, are, they noticed it's a pressing concern. And we've seen here today that in the discussions we've had and people's contributions, that we believe it also is a pressing concern that needs to be addressed and that needs to be looked at. The Equalities and Human Rights Commission reported that up to 2013 found that employment rate for disabled people was nearly 37% lower than non-disabled people. That is totally unacceptable and has to be worked on. We've also discussed today internships and apprenticeships. Now, once again, we're not getting enough disabled people into these organisations and through that process because there are still barriers for them. Uh, they want to have that opportunity, but we're not getting the opportunity for them to be part and parcel of that. Now, the Scottish Government has committed more uh, and has 20 action points uh, about disability employment gap, and I, I wholeheartedly support that. The Fair of Scotland for Disabled People is exactly what we all want to see. Uh, we want to ensure that individuals have that opportunity, but they do experience difficulties. They experience difficulties in affordability about transport. They experience difficulties in job applications and all the barriers that are put up in front of them to struggle into the employment market. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I concur with many of the comments already made here this afternoon. Much more needs to be done to ensure that we can unlock the potential of individuals who just want to have a normal life. That normal life is a home. That normal life is a relationship. And that normal life is a job. And we should stick here together and ensure that we ensure that their dream becomes a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. I call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Elaine Smith. Mr. MacDonald, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scotland Act of 2016 devolved the provision of new employment support services to this Parliament. Following that, in December 2016, the Scottish Government published the report A Fairer Scotland for Disabled People that had five key ambitions and 93 actions. Ambition two, decent income and fairer working lives is aimed at ensuring that disabled people gain an adequate income in order to participate in education, voluntary work or paid employment. And there were over 20 actions to support the delivery of the same. The ink was hardly dry when in April 2017, the first year of it being devolved, the Tory government significantly cut the budget for employability services in Scotland by 87% from the expected 53 million to 7 million. But it was not just in Scotland that the budget was cut. Royal Blind, Scotland's largest vision impairment organization, highlighted in their briefing for this debate that the Work and Health Program, the UK successor to the Work Program and Work Choice, identified that the funding will now be 130 million, down from 541 million, a cut of 400 and 11 million pounds. Despite this background of cuts, the Scottish Government has announced funding that will provide advice and support to employers to recruit disabled people, encourage them to work, offer work experience, paid internships, and more access to modern apprenticeships. This funding, presiding officer, will promote the benefits of recruiting people with disabilities as part of a thriving, diverse workforce and this change in attitude and approach is what is so important, what needs to be more widely adopted, and what I am pleased to see the Scottish Government hone in on, looking at what there is to celebrate rather than worry about, a potential, about potential difficulties is going to play a key part in improving the employability gap for people with disabilities. The Chief Executive of Inclusion Scotland has explained that, unfortunately, for far too long it has been assumed that what stops disabled people from working and progressing in work is some deficit to do with the disabled person themselves. Work programmes that are based on such assumptions have singularly failed to address the disability employment gap down the years. Yet the reasons disabled people are out of work may have nothing at all to do with lack of skills or education, a lack of ability to self-manage a health condition, or a lack of confidence or motivations. In moves to change these assumptions, Fair Start Scotland, Scotland's new devolved employability service that began in April, is offering people with disability support, which identifies and develops their strengths, what they can often uniquely bring to a job and company. We already have close to 300,000 individuals with a disability in work in Scotland with 75% of them employed by the private sector. 
But in order to increase that number, we need SMEs to see the potential benefits for their organisations from having that diverse workforce, especially as unemployment for the fully abled is at a near record low. To create meaningful and long-lasting employment between SMEs and people with disabilities, disabled people and disabled people's organisations must play a central role in developing this partnership. Res recognising that SMEs suffer from a lack of knowledge in employing people with disabilities, it is imperative in order to create any positive progression for employment of disabled people that we do all we can to fill this gap of understanding as well as address concerns or barriers from both the employers and employees' perspective. The Scottish Government's Congress on Disability Employment and the Workplace brought together these groups to do exactly that, and the, U, the new one million funding will ensure employers, particularly those in SMEs, have access to up-to-date... Yeah, carry on. Jamie Harker Jones. I thank the member for taking an invention. Would he suggest that the government looks, the Scottish government looks to the example of the UK government, where 600,000 more disabled people have been, are now in work after four years? Gordon MacDonald. We, we've seen what's happened when the UK government's uh, responsible for employment support services in Scotland. We've got 42% dis, uh, disabled people in work. I think that explains exactly what the UK government's achieved in Scotland. Um, presiding officer, people with disabilities, mental or physical, have a right to work, and I believe that the Scottish Government is putting in place very valuable support for both employers and employees to ensure that more disabled people are in employment. But until that right is realised, we must all continue to play our part to change and challenge existing notions around employing disabled people. Thank you. I call Elaine Smith to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Ms Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. The debate today allows us to look at the progress which has been made on the Scottish Government's action plan on a fairer Scotland for disabled people, launched, as we know, at the end of 2016. And the current consultation on increasing the employment of disabled people in the public sector is welcome in this context. And I want to take this opportunity to start my speech to encourage responses um, to that from communities across Scotland. It's in all our interest to address the unacceptable levels of unemployment and poverty amongst disabled people. A truly inclusive society must surely be able to provide good quality employment, education and training opportunities for all. And improving the experience and opportunities for disabled people in the workplace should be a priority. And I do welcome um, the commitments from the Minister to continue to engage with organisations representing disabled people, including the STUC and its Disabled Workers Committee. President Officer, last week's time for reflection was given by deaf Christian Bible teacher, Mr Kenneth Nuttall, who I had nominated to, to do so. And Kenneth clearly conveyed the importance of understanding the different ways of communicating which deaf people have and the importance that this has in so many different settings. Good communication affects our access to services, our workplaces and our lives. And Kenneth also commended the recognition given to British Sign Language. And I know that our Parliament takes this seriously. And indeed, my colleague, Mark Griffin, MSP, introduced the BSL Scotland Bill. It was the first of its kind in the UK. And I also want to take the opportunity today to commend Mark Griffin for that. Without good communication, it's not possible for everyone to fully participate in the labour market. And I feel that last week's contribution helped to make that important point in this chamber. In order for us to ensure that we're making progress, it's important to improve monitoring by employers. However, this requires disabled workers to disclose their disability. And we've already heard in some of the contributions this afternoon that often workers will be afraid to do this for fear of discrimination or for other reasons. And that was a concern highlighted by the last SGC Disabled Workers Conference. An employee with a recognised disability can receive support in terms of reasonable adjustment in the workplace, and if needed, is entitled to disability leave under the provisions of the Equality Act 2010. Good disability leave policies, though, are few and far between. 
Yet an employer should be fully aware of the difference between an employee's absence from work due to the disability and a general sickness absence policy. So I trust that the Scottish Government will be encouraging employers to understand their obligations under the Equality Act with regard to respecting and providing disability leave um, and perhaps as part of the employer ability mentioned by Alex Cole Hamilton and indeed uh, Alec Rowley earlier in the debate. And also that funding through public procurement reflects the need for adequate staffing levels to support specific individual needs of disabled workers. As the STUC has identified through some very helpful training resources for trade union reps, some conditions are often not recorded with the employer, diabetes being one, when in fact it would be better for everyone if the best possible support is in place. Of course, not all disabilities are visible and not all will be lifelong conditions. In this regard, Disability Agenda Scotland identifies the importance of personalised support and meeting individual needs. And I just would wish to highlight that point again in the Chamber today. Trade union equality reps can also play an important role here. And whilst I welcome the commitments given by the Scottish Government in the past to encourage facility time for equality reps, I would urge support for moving this onto a statutory footing in the public sector. So whilst the focus today is on the labour market and employment, we can't forget that economic inactivity as a measure completely ignores the role of unpaid carers, many of whom themselves are living with a disability. Of course, barriers to employment are complex, and the Minister did mention this in his opening remarks this afternoon. If you can't access suitable public transport or find a suitable home within reasonable travelling distance of your workplace or a nursery place nearby for your children, then sustaining employment becomes much more difficult. One example of which I'm aware are delays for adaptations to social housing. And given that proportionately more disabled people live in the social rented sector, then this is something that is affecting disabled workers right now. The government's commitment to expansion of the childcare sector has been welcomed, but with regard to the topic under discussion today, I'm keen to learn what proportion of the new jobs required as the workforce expands will there be for uh, disabled people. Has sufficient funding been allocated to ensure the necessary support is in place? And are the facilities in the public, private and third sector all accessible and compliant with disability legislation? Presiding officer, for disabled people to be able to take up and remain in employment, we need to put more resources and planning into our social infrastructure so that equal access and equal opportunity becomes a reality. In conclusion, can I just uh, remind the Chamber that actually it was Alf Morris, Labour and Co-op MP, who was responsible in 1970 for the first ever disability legislation and actually thought I could maybe uh, perhaps just end with a quote from Alf Morris when he gave a speech on the 25th anniversary of his act where he said, unfair discrimination leaves disabled people doubly disabled. That is morally wrong. And what is morally wrong ought to surely no longer be legally permissible in Britain. Can I just say that that must also apply in workplaces? Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Oliver Mundell to be followed by Stuart Stevens and Mr. Stevenson will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr. Mundell, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I'd like to begin by going back to the sentiment echoed in the motion um, and picked up on by a number of members across the chamber because there can be absolutely no doubt that the stubbornly high disability employment gap here in Scotland is unacceptable. Not only is it a tragedy on an individual level but in a small country we simply cannot afford to miss out on the talent, skills and wider social benefits of ensuring the full and genuine inclusion of all our citizens. This is a particularly pressing point in rural communities such as the Dumfrieshire constituency that I'm proud to represent. It's a point I raised with Professor Russell Griggs, the new head of the South of Scotland Enterprise Partnership, which is laying the foundations uh, and groundwork for the new South of Scotland Enterprise Agency. In a region where there's a net outflow of young people, it seems particularly crazy that we see a number of young people locally written off by society and by employers. While attitudes are clearly changing and there are some signs of pro progress, we must all accept the reality that we are a very long way off the end goal. Not only is this deeply demoralizing and unfair to the individuals concerned, but for society and communities uh, such as Dumfrieshire as a whole, we're paying a very high price for ongoing stigma and discrimination. That's why I hope that for the new enterprise agency with its focus uh, beyond uh, just commercial activity, looking at, at some social issues, um, I hope it will be 
a key priority uh, for them moving forward. Uh, as it happens, and I'll leave it to members to decide whether or not it was a coincidence, but I did meet Professor Russell Griggs at the usual place in Dumfries. It's a social enterprise and cafe offering employment and training opportunities and qualifications to young people with a disability uh, or additional support need. This project is an outstanding example of what can be done with the right support and where our services are led and driven by the individuals who benefit from them. Uh, like uh, Gillian Martin, uh, I do recognise the importance of the third sector because I think uh, in many cases it offers the additional flexibility but also uh, my experience is that the individuals involved in charities and organisations such as The Usual Place have a real passion and drive and determination uh, that adds something over and above and it's actually inspirational to the individuals uh, that they help. And The Usual Place has already proven itself to be successful, helping a number of young people into meaningful employment and also encouraging them to look at setting up their own businesses. But more than that, it's challenged wider social attitudes and inspired others in the community to look again at what steps they could take within their own business and workplace to break down barriers. Through my experience of The Usual Place and, and other similar organisations locally, I've seen that, as other members have commented upon, uh, that many of the issues uh, around the employment gap go much wider uh, than just employment itself. Issues around transport, uh, around housing, around uh, the support that people receive through social security. Um, and I think that that point can't be emphasised enough. Uh, from my own perspective, um, education and training lie right at the heart um, of ensuring that those with disabilities, mental ill health and additional support needs are as fully equipped for the workplace as possible. Too often we see them denied opportunities before they even get to a job interview. That's not good enough and when capable young people are leaving schools without qualifications, we can't then turn around and pretend that we're surprised that they struggle to gain employment. I think we also need to do more, as other members have said, to demonstrate to employers the benefits of recruiting a more diverse workforce. And I do recognise some of the issues that smaller organisations without dedicated HR teams and without the flexibility of a larger workforce uh, uh, often uh, complain about or raise uh, concern with. Uh, but I do think uh, there are a whole range of initiatives out there uh, to make it easier uh, to deliver uh, special, um, special requests and um, other uh, measures that can be a barrier to hiring the best person for the job. Uh, like Rhoda Grant in closing, presiding officer myself, I've uh, been able to take part in Inclusion Scotland's We Can Work internship scheme. And I've learned a great deal um, from that, uh, probably more uh, than Fiona. Uh, but in closing, I wanted uh, to uh, let the Chamber know that uh, she's done a great job in that time to really challenge uh, perceptions, not just that I have, uh, but using her role within my office to speak out and use her own voice to campaign on disability issues. And Fiona said uh, this week uh, that she's determined to push forward uh, work around British Sign Language uh, because she is sure uh, that the next First Minister of Scotland uh, or indeed the person who will find a cure to cancer could be sitting in a school in Dumfrieshire without the support and help that they need uh, to uh, make all that they can of their life and I think that is the point. There's a huge untapped pool of talent out there that we're all missing out on uh, and if we can get this right uh, then it will make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mundell. I call Stuart Stevenson, last speak in the open debate. Move to closing speeches after that. Mr. Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I think my key skill is an ability to conceal gaps in my personal knowledge and skills. Uh, for example, I play no, no musical instrument. I would judge it a great success if I drove a golf ball uh, more than 100 metres and my swimming abilities are close to nil. Now, the reason I raise uh, those shortcomings uh, that I have is to illustrate that there'll be many disabled people who can exceed me on any one of these shortcomings. And that will be repeated for all of us here. In other words, being disabled in one part of your life 
does not mean that you do not have abilities in another part of your life. And I think that's a key thing that we should all remember. But also, I think it's surprising that we haven't talked much about how we need to get inside the mind of many disabled people who are talked down perhaps quite early in their lives and made to think less of themselves than they should do. We need to look for some role models uh, that illustrate that having a disability is not an impediment to a successful life. It's only two months uh, since Stephen Hawking died at the age of 76. Um, his intellect far surpasses, and I think I won't be challenged if I put it this way, the collective intellect of us all here. I can read his book, uh, a brief history of time. I seem to understand each sentence as I meet it, but when I ever get to the end of the book, I find very little that has penetrated the cerebral cavity uh, on a permanent uh, basis. Now, Alec Rowley uh, talked about uh, people who are disabled and unable to work. Uh, and I, th I think that is certainly true. But I'd like to put a different gloss on it, if I may. And that is, People who can't work are nonetheless able to contribute to society, to give us something that is of value simply by existing, even if that's to a small circle of family and friends, but very often uh, to a much uh, wider circle, and we should not forget that. Now, some further models of uh, uh, achievement uh, in disabled people. Uh, Dennis Robertson, a late member here, of course, as we know, was blind. Um, I had a work colleague uh, when I went to join uh, the Bank of Scotland in Computers in uh, 1969. Uh, I was stuck in a room to read some manuals to learn about what computers were and what you did with them. And there was this person who used to come into this room, walk across the room, get some blank punch cards, put them in the punch machine, punch things out, take them away and, wait, uh, and off he went about his way. And it was in the second week when I'd moved the heater in the room, because it was very cold, it was approaching winter, and he walked straight into it, that I got a full mouthful of uh, abuse from Brian. Uh, Brian was blind. And I had not known he was blind for the first 10 days I'd known him. And Brian, because he was blind, he had learned more or less off by heart all the technical manuals related to the IBM computers we use. We used to go to Brian with all our really difficult questions, and he always uh, had the answer. Another example of uh, someone turning a disability into uh, an advantage, into a success. But the other thing that there is, and we've had reference to it, is invisible disability, particularly mental ill health, mental uh, incapacity, and indeed deafness. It's not obvious that somebody is deaf. And I think we've got to think uh, very hard about how we help people with invisible disabilities uh, to see a way forward in their lives and to help uh, employers understand uh, that they are of value in their company. We've talked a bit about the economic contribution uh, that can come from increasing the number of people we employ. I've no time for that argument for a single second. Um, we, are, we, we are all not here to serve an abstract idea that is called the economy. The economy is here to serve us, not to enslave us. And I think we should remember uh, that whenever we consider this subject and a whole uh, wider range uh, of other uh, uh, subjects. Um, it's interesting, there are some wonderful uh, models of disability people. There are now quite a lot of disabled comedians. And ain't that great, it engages you and, and draws uh, you in. I think I'll just simply close, by, presiding officer, by reminding us what it actually says in the title of this debate. A fairer Scotland for disabled people. Disabled people. Forget disabled, we're all people. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. Now I move to closing speeches. I call on Mark Griffin to close for Labour. Please, a generous six minutes, Mr. Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased that we've had an opportunity to debate how to deliver the right to work for Scotland's disabled people. I think thanks are due to Inclusion Scotland, MS Society Scotland, and others for the, the briefings, as well as Disability Agenda Scotland, who published their End the Gap report last 
autumn. All of those briefings in that report, and in fact, all of, I think almost all the speakers today have underlined the fact that the disability employment gap of 43% is unacceptable. And last year, I had the, the pleasure of hosting uh, the DAS annual reception in Parliament, and today's debate allows us to recap on that event where the six charities that make up the organisation made their call for a target to help more disabled people into or to return to employment. And the right to work should be universal work. It's, of course, my party's purpose. If disabled or not, work should give you independence, freedom from poverty, and support you in building relationships. And that's why our amendment today borrows directly from the, the DAS report, eh? because we in Scotland must get on with setting our own target to close the employment gap. With just two in five disabled people in work, we must use our powers and make our commitment that anyone can live out their right to work. The Inclusion Scotland briefing rightly says we should be working together um, to close the gap, to close that gap all together and I hope members agree that we must uh, set targets to, to make progress on that journey. And given the rate of disabled workers in the Scottish Government is, is barely above that of the, the private sector at 12%, I think the public sector has to offer much more leadership in building a more inclusive workforce, a point made strongly by Jeremy Balfour. And some colleagues in, in the chamber might have noticed that since the Easter recess, I've been wearing a hearing aid. And that for me is a, a very minor just a, a very minor adjustment, but still a minor disability. We, we know how lacking this chamber is in terms of the visible representation of disabled people. And as Phil Meyer from Inclusion Scotland pointed out, that Parliament should have around 23 disabled MSPs in, in line with the call, the calls of the, the one in five um, campaign. Changing that rate is in our gift and we can set new rules to encourage more people into politics. Last year's access to elected office fund showed how we can do it well and more disabled people now have the opportunity and privilege of representing their communities. But for normal workplaces, it's our job to make sure we put the support in place to secure that right for them to work. And, President Officer, looking that at the, the End the Gap report, I'm struck by recommendation eight, that the system is unnecessarily complex. We've got Fair Start Scotland, access to work, the employer recruitment initiative, the single work and health gateway, and those are just a few of the schemes. And how they all slot together or who has responsibility for it, it is unclear. And one of those schemes, access to work, is described as one of the DWP's best kept secrets. It helps with additional transport costs and for the deaf community, it could pay for communication support and equipment. The report highlights it provides a 48% return on investment, but employers know very little about it. And crucially, it focuses on adapting the workplace not just moulding a disabled person for the workplace. And coordinating support is understandably complex. It requires uh, responsible, inclusive employers to make necessary ad adjustments. A government putting the conditions in place to link disabled people with those employers. But the disabled people who want to work need to be in the right position to seek and take up work. With uh, gig employment, zero hours contracts, and growing insecure work. Workers without a disability are struggling in the, in the workplace. And a number of speakers have pointed out um, that this debate is being held against a backdrop of potential cuts to the Protected Places Scheme, which puts at risk 600 jobs. And that's just the latest act of a UK government, which the UN has said is systematically violating the rights of disabled people to lead the lives they want. Ending re-employ, removal of disability premiums and cuts to ESA, the bedroom tax, and portraying disabled people as scroungers and fraudsters have all given the UK this shameful title. But with a new 
fairer Scottish social security system coming and Fair Start Scotland schemes rolling out, there will be a, cha a change in the opportunities disabled people in Scotland will have. Um, though social security will not be income replacement benefits, it will help to meet the costs of having a disability arising from day-to-day -day tasks and the mobility support that people need to get to work or to keep them in work if they acquire an impairment. And when I, I challenged the Social Security Committee to set a disability poverty reduction target in the Social Security Bill, I think colleagues fairly pointed out that the levers over income replacement benefits remain the responsibility of Westminster. But disability, disability employment is also a big part of tackling that disability poverty because almost half of people in poverty live with a disabled family member. Setting a disability employment target with specific timescales would be an incremental step to both prove our commitment and responsibility to tackle disability poverty too. And President Officer, it's fair to say that all parties across the Chamber, I think, want to close that gap. We all want to, to have it and go further, but the question is when. When the, the TUC warned in 2016 that the UK government was years behind schedule in delivering its manifesto commitment to have the gap by 2020. The, the Tories' response was to water it down to get one million of the three million people disabled into work by 2030. I think advocating its responsibility. Now, President officer, maybe today we start to build a path to having the gap and urge colleagues to support the Labour Amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Call Michelle Valentine to close to the Conservatives. A generous seven minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. May I first refer the Chamber to my register of interests as I am a business owner and employer. As we've heard from across the Chamber this afternoon, we are all committed to building a fairer Scotland for disabled people. With a million people in Scotland living with a disability or long-term limiting health condition, we need to harness that wealth of talent, experience and diversity. Gaining new skills, earning a wage, developing a career are not and should not be the prerogative of the physically and mentally fit and healthy. Barriers to employment, both perceived and real, need to be addressed so that Scotland's disabled population can, can participate in both the economy and their communities. I share the Minister's position that this will take an all Scotland approach and I welcome the creation of his new working group. Disability does come in many forms and it is not always visible. However, we know that the ability to participate plays a major role in improving mental health, building social skills and helping disabled people stay active and well. These challenges are not new or indeed unnoticed, but we all have a lot to learn. And like Rhoda Grant, as an employer, I know the benefits firsthand from working with and employing disabled people. I therefore welcome initiatives such as the recent Deaf Awareness Week, a fantastic multi-group campaign highlighting the challenges deaf people face. I also welcome the intent displayed by the Scottish Government in their Fairer Scotland Action Plan, and more recently at the Congress on Disability Employment and Workplace. Alex Cole Hamilton and Ruth Maguire mentioned the new word, employability, and the government's £1 million grant. These are promising steps in the right direction, and I look forward to reviewing the detailed action plan due for publication in the autumn, as well as examining the results of the consultation on disabled employment in the public sector. But I would echo the sentiments of Alex Rowley and other members that disabled people are strong partners in identifying the barriers and solutions for this plan. It must be a co-production. However, although the target of re reducing disability employment gap by half is admirable, we have yet to see the time frame for this ambition. And Rhoda Grant rightly said she didn't want this parliament to be having this same debate in 10 years time. I therefore would urge the Scottish Government to follow the advice of Disability Agenda Scotland and aim for a realistic but ambitious target to close the employment gap. <laughs> I can see you died to get yeah, up. Yeah, you looked poised <laughs> and we were looking at it. Yeah, we both looked for... he was poised. Minister. Waiting for the correct juncture, oh, right. presenting officer. I take on board the point. Let me make very clear we will be supporting the, the Labour Amendment. I absolutely recognise the necessity for us to set realistic and meaningful targets. But in that regard, and without wanting to strike a, any form of discord, would you share with me uh, regret that the UK government has moved away 
from an explicit target of having the risk of an employment gap now to saying that they want to see one million more disabled people employed, which is not the same thing. Michelle Ballantyne. No, I think that, that is a decision for the UK government. And having got 600,000 people into work in the last five years, there's been huge progress. I think for Scotland, you've actually said that you want, you want to see this halved. So I'm asking, what is your time frame for that? You've made a statement, we're asking for a time frame. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is the year of the young people and the Disability Agenda Scotland, an alliance of leading disability charities in Scotland, have highlighted young people as the group most affected by the disability employment gap. Research highlighted by the group identified that although half of disabled young people were in further education nine months after leaving school, by the time they reach 26, they are four times more likely to be unemployed than their non-disabled peers, an unacceptable potential lifetime of unemployment. Skills Development Scotland advised that the percentage of disabled young people participating in education has fallen, pushing the education particip participation gap up to 7% between young people with and without disabilities. Jamie Halker Johnson talked about the challenges of providing careers advice and support, particularly around those young people with learning difficulties, and asked the question, what can we do better to prepare these young people for employment? But even if a disabled young person obtains a degree, Papworth Trust figures reveal that graduate unemployment is 15.5% higher for disabled graduates. The Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce have made some good inroads in this area, but more work must be done to make sure all our young people can get into employment, not just those without disabilities. No doubt we will be looking to see if the Scottish Government's youth employment strategy is successful in achieving its 10th key performance indicator, which is to increase the employment rate for young disabled people to the population average by 2021. So there you have, a, 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 I suppose, an actual time limit for young people. As Gillian Martin highlighted, early intervention is key to ensuring disabled people can successfully enter the workforce. Of course, unemployment isn't an issue which just simply affects young people. It's prevalent across all age groups. But Oliver Mandel highlighted that in a small rural population, a very high price is being paid for ongoing stigma. Whilst Jeremy Balfour raised the important issue of ensuring that employers feel confident about employing disabled people and recognising that while we must need to support and encourage disabled young people, we also need to be realistic when giving them their options. Both Mr. Mandel and Elaine Smith and others talked about the important role of the third sector plays in, in supporting people and providing employment for disabled people. And we need to take some of the weight off their shoulders. And I agree with others when they talked about how we need to look at how we support the public sector and the private sector to create more employment and be able to support people once they are employed. George Adam and others talked about the need to ensure that employment of disabled people is not tokenistic. And the issue of quotas came up. Now, I have no doubt that the issue of quotas will remain a point of debate, but the key thing is that it isn't tokenistic. In conclusion, presiding officer, Scotland still has some way to go in reducing the disability employment gap. Scottish Government figures show that there are just over 3.5% fewer disabled people in work now than when this current government came to power. Additionally, the unemployment rate for disabled people in Scotland is 3% higher than the rest of the UK. We've spoken several times about the fact that 600,000 disabled people across the UK have moved into employment since 2013, so something must be working. With the devolution of new welfare powers to this Parliament, including the ability to top up benefits, it will be absolutely clear now that Scotland and Scotland alone is responsible for its track record on cutting the disabled employment gap. My recent visits to the Royal Blind School... We haven't got time, I'm afraid, and that was an awful long conclusion. You must conclude, please. Sorry. That many disabled people are highly skilled, intelligent, charismatic. By not utilising their skills, we're making a mistake and a foolish one at that. Thank you very much. And can I remind members to speak through the chair and not to use the you word? One day, you're all going to remember that, and I'll celebrate. I now call Jamie Hebburn to close for the Government Minister. Nine minutes, or the, just under nine minutes. It will thank you, uh, President Officer. I will not use that word in relation to, to anyone else. Uh, can I also uh, thank uh, members who have contributed to 
to today's debate, it's very clear that there is a broad consensus across the Chamber for uh, this agenda. There are clearly some uh, differences, but I think we are united in our desire to, uh, to move forward with a, a sense of urgency uh, in relation to the, the agenda we have uh, set our, ourselves. Let me uh, pick up on some of the issues that have been raised over the course of the debate. Let me start off with the point that uh, Jeremy Balfour uh, made, one with uh, which I actually agree. Uh, he talked about the mythology that uh, somehow the private sector is bad and the public sector is good in, in relation to the employment of disabled people. And the figures show very clearly that's not the case. It is the case that the uh, employment rate is uh, higher in the public sector. But when you consider that of the overall public sector workforce, 11.7% uh, are uh, disabled people by comparison to with 11% uh, in the private sector, it isn't exactly something to, to write home about. Neither uh, sector is uh, performance. So that underlines the scale of the challenge before us. Uh, turning to, to Mr Halcrow Johnson's uh, comments, and in particular his intervention on Gordon Macdonald and also the point made by uh, Michelle Ballantyne about 600,000 uh, more disabled people being in work over the last four years uh, across uh, the UK. Uh, he uh, was looking for some reassurance about the uh, the position here in Scotland. What I can say is that over the last four years there are 55,000 more disabled people in employment in Scotland, which if it offers how many reassurance, I suppose I must say that uh, we're moving broadly in the same direction uh, here in Scotland as well. But I would urge caution with those numbers, and this goes to the fundamental point I was making my intervention on Michelle Ballantyne, because a lot of that uh, change has been driven by demographic uh, change. Uh, what we see there is that people who are already in uh, the workplace become fall into the category of being disabled and effectively those who are already far removed from the labour market remain out with employment and that has to be our fundamental task to reach out to those who are not in work and get them into uh, employment. Uh, in that regard I, I agree with uh, Jamie Halker Johnson's point that we do have to consider uh, how many people have missed opportunity or is that does represent lost potential that goes back to the point I made uh, in the uh, at the outset of today's a debate, a President Officer, that represents a, a social injustice. Everyone should have a, that opportunity. I agree a, with Mark Griffin's perspective. The, the right to work should be a universal one. I agree. Sorry, just a minute. I, I, it's, not, it's not acceptable that you have your back to the chair and have a conversation, Mr. So, are we back to your seat? Well, Minister. Well, well, how unfortunate, President Officer, just to say I agree with Alec Cole Hamilton. Um, <laughs> Uh, when he says that uh, being in work offers uh, social connectivity, he was obviously engaging a little too much social connectivity a, a, a moment ago. But, um, uh, of course, when it's done correctly in the workplace, it's uh, an apt thing uh, to do. And uh, Rhoda Grant was quite right to say as well, uh, our work can uh, define us. So we must ensure uh, that everyone has that uh, opportunity. It also, uh, as I said earlier, uh, it represents an economic injustice. But also, the flip side of that is there's an economic imperative here in terms of getting uh, more disabled people into employment. Our labour market statistics right now uh, show that we actually have high levels of employment. But despite that, when I'm out speaking to employers, they will uh, tell me that they still have vacancies, they still have skills uh, gaps. So we cannot afford to have uh, a situation where we overlook the talents of disabled people in Scotland. Oliver Mundell was quite correct to make that point. And indeed, Alec Rowley was quite correct to highlight the boost to the economy that getting more disabled people into employment would uh, represent. The Scottish Government's chief economic advisor uh, recognises that having the disab uh, disability employment gap would lead to a 3.5% increase to GDP. So efforts must be made uh, to get more disabled people into employment. Some are underway. Rhoda Grant and Oliver Mundell referred to the, uh, the Inclusion Scotland internship programme, something I have been very happy to take part in. The Scottish Government also it uh, supports an internship programme uh, within its own uh, workforce. We support the Access to Elected Office Fund that uh, Mark Griffin and George uh, Adam uh, mentioned. Uh, Gillian Martin uh, spoke uh, about some of the, the work being undertaken by Project uh, Search uh, and also uh, through some of the third sector organisations that she was uh, laying out doing work uh, in her area, supporting those with a learning disability to get into employment and in that regard let me offer an absolute assurance to Alison Johnson that Fair Start Scotland will uh, fully support those with uh, a learning disability which is particularly important because we know that uh, in particular for those with a learning disability the employment rate is uh, worse still than the overall uh, employment rate for those 
with a disability. So it is important that we take every effort to ensure that that is a group of people who we support. In terms of the overall issue with the disability employment gap, I think we were quite correct, a number of members were quite correct to make the point that the, the problem is not with disabled people, the problem is a societal one. Uh, at that point was made by Jeremy Valfer, Ruth Maguire, Gordon MacDonald in particular, and they spoke about the mythology that it, it exists out there, the misunderstanding of the abilities of disabled people. And let me say, I thought Stuart Stevenson's illustration of the innate abilities of uh, people was a very good way uh, to, to move uh, forward and to, to, to look at these things. Uh, Ruth Maguire spoke about the, the necessity for uh, adjustments, reasonable adjustments to be made in uh, the workplace. Uh, that's already a, a statutory requirement, uh, President Officer, uh, and the starting position we must adopt, it uh, must be at the very least to expect as a minimum employers to uh, do what they're legally uh, obliged to. And can I assure Elaine Smith uh, on that regard that the Scottish Government will strongly encourage employers to be aware of their uh, legal responsibilities as a minimum. And I'll give way to Dan Johnson. Very Daniel Johnson. I thank the Minister for giving way, and I, I very much agree with his points about needing to do more for, to ensure that employers make reasonable adjustments for those with disability. But disability isn't just about those with physical disability, it's also people with uh, uh, intellectual and, and indeed neurological disabilities such as neurovermental disorders such as dyslexia, dyspraxia. Would you agree with me that more needs to be done both around raising awareness and making sure employers do more to make reasonable adjustments for people such as those? And I bear in mind that I have ADHD. Yes. Well, indeed I do, and I think uh, Mr Johnson's, if he doesn't mind me saying, his willingness to come to this chamber and talk about his personal experience is an important one, because it shows people out there watching this debate, and any debate where he makes that point, that we as a, a parent are willing to engage uh, in talking about these uh, issues. Uh, let me uh, uh, come to conclude, uh, President Officer, because I, I do uh, agree with the point that's been made, by, the point that was made by, Ruth, uh, by Rhoda Grant, that wishful thinking alone will not achieve the objectives we have set ourselves. I agree, we do need to set uh, meaningful but realistic targets. We need to set a meaningful and realistic timescale. And we need to be transparent about how we're going to achieve having the disability employment gap. That's why we will have no hesitation in supporting the Labour amendment uh, this evening. And indeed, we'll also be supporting the, the Tory amendment uh, as well. So let me assure Rory Grant that whilst we agree with that point, we'll also be getting on right now with the work we've set ourselves, the task we've set ourselves to get ready to half the disability employment gap. Our first priorities will be to take for the announcements made by the First Minister at the Congress in April, the consultation on whether the public sector should have targets for disability employment rates, the publication of the Disability Employment Action Plan uh, later this year. Those are the things we'll be getting on with immediately, President Officer. But of course, this is a significant effort that we must undertake. I am very clear, and as I said at the outset of this debate, the work is not the government's alone, and it cannot be achieved by the government alone, but the government will be a leader on these matters. But today, uh, President Officer, I call on everyone across Scotland to come with us on this journey, one that will take us closer to a more diverse workforce where everyone has the chance to flourish and disabled people are able to fulfil their potential. Can I thank the... Uh Minister and members, and that concludes our debate on a fairer Scotland for disabled people. And we turn, uh, in fact, before we turn to decision time, um, members will recall that Daniel Johnson raised a point of order uh, last Thursday regarding the Education and Skills Committee. The issue related to the conduct of the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills and the officials working for him. And... Uh, Although I was grateful that the, the member did give me advance notice, uh, because decision time had been brought forward last Thursday, uh, I did receive very short notice, a few minutes notice, uh, of, a, of the point of order, which highlighted several rather detailed points. And it was for those reasons that I undertook to look into the matter and return to members now with my response. Now, as members will be aware, I should say first and foremost that complaints against ministers are for the ministerial code and complaints against civil servants are for the civil service code. <clears throat> In relation to this specific matter, I understand that further clarification from the government has been requested by some members of the Education Committee. And no doubt the Cabinet Secretary and its officials will respond as soon as practicable. And I think that process needs to be allowed to take place. 
However, in terms, of, in terms of the wider point about the relationship between committees and the Scottish Government, the protocol on this is long-standing and is between the Scottish Government and the conveners group. It's important to ensure that this protocol works for both the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government and recognises the respective role of both. I hope that addresses the point of order. We turn now to decision time. And there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that amendment 12344.1 in the name of Jamie Halker Johnson, which seeks to amend motion 12344 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on a fairer Scotland for disabled people tackling the employment gap be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 12344.2 in the name of Rhoda Grant, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Jamie Hepburn be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12344.2 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 81, no, 28. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 12344 in the name of Jamie Hepburn as amended is agreed. Can we all, sorry, are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 12344 in the name of Jamie Hepburn as amended is yes 81, no 28. There were no abstentions and the motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members business in the name of Liam Kerr on increasing awareness of restorative justice within the criminal justice system. And we'll just take a few moments for members and the minister to change seats. <laughs> 